Okay. I think this is episode 19 of Rockford Reading Daily. This episode is coming out about 12 hours later than than usual. That's for a couple of different reasons. The main reason is, though, because of uh, my procrastination, so I want to apologize for that. Uh, but the most previous episode of Rockford Reading Daily, we... Completed reading, Have Black Lives Ever Matter by Mamiya Abu-Jamal. And in the completion of reading that, I wrote a, a piece for the news, the May 30th Alliance newsletter, which if you're not subscribed to the newsletter, uh, send your email, subscribe to the newsletter. You can do that uh, through a link on the top of our Instagram page and through uh, on Facebook. Weekly, we post uh, a place where you can go to sign up for the newsletter. But in the May 30th Alliance newsletter, uh, I wrote a piece basically uh, just a reflection or a, sort of like a, a book report about have Bla- about the book Have Black Lives Ever Matter by Mamiya Abu-Jamal. And so what I want to do in this episode is to read through that and then even uh, have a dialogue about this, uh, this piece that I wrote. So I'm going to go through, read the piece, and then after reading the piece, I'm going to dissect the piece and then dissect just the overall scope view of Have Black Lives Ever Mattered by Mamiya Abu-Jamal. <clears throat> Have Black Lives Ever Mattered by Mamiya Abu-Jamal, a reflection written by Leslie Roth. There is no way to grasp the gravity of the passages inside of the book, quote, Have Black Lives Ever Mattered, end quote, without understanding the circumstances that author Mamiya Abu-Jamal wrote them under. After being brutally beat and shot by the Philadelphia police in December of 1981, Mamiya Abu-Jamal was arrested, charged with killing a police officer, convicted, and then sentenced to death. His imprisonment has drawn criticism from activists, news publications, and Amnesty International, a global movement campaigning to end abuse of human rights, who denounced the trial, stating it failed to meet the lowest standard of judicial fairness. Mamiya Mamiya remains in prison to this day, not because of his guilt, but because of his political stances as an independent journalist in the 1970s. More than just writing about police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice, Mamiya Abu-Jamal has led a life plagued by these evils. Introduction Mamiya introduces the book by summarizing the past 400 years of experiences for people of color in the Americas, specifically North America. There are brief mentions of the genocide of the indigenous peoples of the land, the chattel slavery of Africans, the terrorizing of blacks by white supremacists during Reconstruction and Jim Crow, and finally, the tumultuous relationship between police and black people at the end of the 20th century. After presenting centuries worth of evidence that points to the United States of America's lack of care, if not hatred, for the existence of people of color, in particular blacks, the introduction concludes by posing the question, quote, have black lives ever mattered? End quote, in an almost rhetorical manner. End of the century. The book is written in short passages that span from 1998 until 2017, with each passage touching on an event of police terrorism, mass incarceration, or racial injustice that made national or local news headlines. The first event is the brutal murder of James Byrd Jr. in Jasper, Texas, which garnered national attention as a hate crime. Mamiya contrasts the national attention the murder of James Byrd Jr. got to the lack of attention received by the similarly brutal murder of a young black man in Virginia who was beaten, burned, and decapitated by white, quote, friends, end quote, he was drinking with. Mumia claims that it's the mainstream media which is the determining factor as to what stories we hear about nationally, and furthermore, the narratives of those stories are typically decided upon by law enforcement and not by the facts of the case. This brings, to mind Ahmaud, this brings to mind Ahmaud Arbery, who was murdered by Travis McMichael, Gregory McMichael, and William Roddy Bryan in Georgia on February 23, 2020. Since law enforcement didn't initially charge the, murder, the murderers of Ahmaud with the crime that originally, excuse me, since law enforcement didn't initially charge the murderers of Ahmad with the crime, the original narrative was one of no wrongdoing, which meant there was no national headlines. However, two months after the murder, 
When a video recording of the man chasing the men chasing and killing Ahmad leaked to the public, charges were brought up against the three men involved, and the video altered the narrative. If the in the life if the life of Ahmad Arbery mattered, why did it take a viral video and national outcry for the three men who murdered him to be held accountable? Today it is October 30th, 2021, and the jury selection for the trial of the men involved in this hate crime is on day nine. And up until this point, the entire handling of the case by the criminal justice system in Brunswick County have been negligent at best and corrupt at worst. This type, of, this type of gross mishandling of justice by the judicial system when it comes to black people is examined in the early stages of this book as well. And it's made abundantly clear that even though the first 37, and it is made abundantly clear that even though the first 37 pages are all events that take place at the end of the 20th century, they read as if they could be pulled from the headlines of today's news stories. FBI. The FBI comes to under scrutiny throughout the pages of, quote, have black lives ever mattered, end quote, as Mami Abu-Jamal exposes the role they have played institutionally in perpetuating and protecting police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice throughout the 120 years of its existence. This corrupt history is contrasted with the fact that often, after police murder civilians, it is the FBI who black leaders call to for help. This irony manifested itself here in Rockford, Illinois in the spring of 2020, when multiple organizations and individuals sought federal attention and assistance to investigate notable police killings that occurred in Rockford, Illinois. Meanwhile, the, the, then, the then chief of police, Dan O'Shea, was thanking his, quote, federal partners, end quote, for help in dispersing protesters on August 1st, 2020, an act that was executed by using pepper spray, tackles and punches. The passages about the FBI serve as reminders that we cannot look to institutions that have routinely been the enemy of the people, particularly the federal government, to be our saviors or allies in this struggle. Instead, we must build the type of organizations that can be powerful enough to combat these. Obama administration. The bulk of the events of police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice covered in this book take place while the country has a black man sitting in the highest office in the land, adding an element to these macroaggressions of violence that did not exist during previous struggles for black liberation. Mamiya used this as an opportunity to dissect how distinctions of class, wealth, status, and prominence does not prohibit black people from experiencing acts of police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice in America. Painting a picture of how the color line still dominates the existence of people in this society, even if black people, like Barack Obama, now enjoy some of the benefits of Americanism, because at any moment, they could still be subjugated to the same oppression as the masses of people of color. We can see this issue playing out in Rockford, Illinois as well, where a black woman, Carla Redd, has been named as the new chief of police, a move the political system in Rockford has made in an effort to thwart claims of systematic racism existing inside of their police department. The truth is, however, that as long as these institutions, whether they be the executive branch of government or a local police department, are embedded with racism, simply putting a black face at the head of them will not change their character. It will only mask it, and eventually that mask will be ripped off. Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown. The events surrounding the murders of Trayvon Martin on February 26, 2012 and Michael Brown on August 9, 2014 serve as the central elements of, quote, have black lives ever mattered, end quote. With the litany list of acts of state sanctioned violence that happened around the same time period as those also being examined. Mamiya describes these 21st century lynchings of black people, excuse me, Mamiya des describes these 21st century lynchings as breaking points for a new generation of black people who would take to the streets in unprecedented fashion to protest against the miscarriages of justice that led to these acts happening and that also prevented anyone from being held accountable in the aftermath. A much needed perspective is provided on a protest around the murder of Trayvon Martin and the acquittal of George Zimmerman along with the uprising around the murder of Michael Brown and no charges being brought against Darren Wilson. Mamiya gives voice to the indignation and frustration that was felt, especially by younger generations of black people, due to their powerlessness to obtain justice for not only Trayvon and Michael, but also the countless others whose lives have been stolen by police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice in the recent years. 
These feelings would only be compounded as Rakia Boyd, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, Alton Sterling, and Philando Castile will be names added to the long list of those murdered by police departments around the country currying national attention. Analyzing these events collectively as opposed to individually perfectly illustrates why, when George Floyd was murdered by police, officers Der police officer Derek Chauvin on May 25, 2020, the city of Minneapolis exploded with hundreds of cities across the United States of America following suit shortly after, including Rockford. Rockford. During the time span covered in this book, there were over a dozen murders that took place in Rockford, Illinois, as the direct result of police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. The same order of events which took place after national stories of state-sanctioned violence, of state-sanctioned violence, victim after victim being criminalized and dehumanized by police and media as their murder is being justified by grand juries and attorneys, also took place in Rockford. Adding insult to injury, these local events never garnered the attention that the national ones did, which gives the perception of the stories being swept under the rug and forgotten. One of the key aspects of this book is the importance of exposing and remembering not just the countless murders that have garnered national attention, but also the innumerable murders by police which have been pushed to the margins of our society. The uprising that happened here in Rockford, Illinois on May 30th, 2020 is what happens when there is no more room under the rug. Conclusion. In his final passages, quote, have black lives ever mattered, end quote, initiates the conversation of the role a mass movement will play in the struggle against police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. The dangers, the difficulties, and the responsibilities that surround movement building against state-sanctioned violence are laid out as Mamiya uses the lives of past activists to illustrate the lengths that institutions, particularly the FBI, will go to in order to maintain the country's status quo. This call back to the corruption in the FBI is somewhat of a full circle moment from previous denoun denouncements of the Bureau and accents the overall theme of how important it is to know the history of these institutions if we are to adequately combat them. This emphasis on being knowledgeable of the origins of institutions continues as Mamiya closes the book with the brief history of slave patrols and how they directly influence the type of policing that exists in the country today. Mamiya holds the belief that it will take a mass movement to overcome the evils that claim the lives of the names mentioned in this book, but that at any moment that any movement formed without proper education on police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice will ultimately be unsuccessful. The question of, quote, have black lives ever mattered, end quote, is answered finally by Mamiya in the affirmative in the last sentence of the book. However, I cannot help but to come away with the belief that black lives matter only as much and as long as we collectively make them matter. OK, so that was the passage that uh, the reflection that I wrote after reading through uh, Have Black Lives Ever Matter by Mamiya Abu-Jamal. What I want to do with the rest of this podcast is to just uh, have a, a discussion jumping around different points in the book to try to to expound on some of the things that I wrote as well. And I want to start with this. And I think that each has been multiple books that we've been reading. And I have this vision board or this, this idea of sort of like forming a, some type of canon where you can, where we can do two things where we can uh, go through time periods and just sort of order these different books into different time periods that they fit in through the chapters that they uh, through chapters or passages uh, and what those chapters or passages are about. And so I see, uh, let's say we do 19, 1960s or 1970s and we've read through the new Jim Crow and we've read as Michelle Alexander touched on uh, police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice uh, from the perspective in which she's struggling against it in the new Jim Crow. And we've read the end of policing and the end of policing has segments where it does the same thing. It speaks about the 1960s and 70s and uh, the book Police Locking Up Our Own and uh, we're going through and reading Just Mercy on IGTV and, uh, and so I say this to say that 
a, a lot of these books do the work of going back before they start speaking about the issues uh, in the present moment that they are combating them. And I think one of the things that is good for comprehension is to be able to remember when other people harken back. And so uh, whenever I read through any of these books touching on these issues and they harken back to the 1960s or 1970s or uh, Mamiya harken back to uh, uh, Africans uh, coming over in the Middle Passage and the genocide that took place uh, on this uh, uh, on this land. I always think about all the things that other people have wrote about these things. And to me, that each time I read a new person's perspective on it or uh, a new book that touches on it, that review always... Uh, uh, enlightens me on something that I didn't see before or that somebody didn't touch on before because this person is touching on it in a different light or in a different perspective or from a different angle or the review of something that I have read before makes something stick that didn't stick the time uh, previously that I read it. And so uh, I was thankful that, again, I had that experience with reading uh, Have Black Lives Ever Mattered uh, by Mami Abu-Jamal as he went through the introduction and spoke about Africans being kidnapped and then Africans being brought over here, about the indigenous people here being uh, enslaved and being killed and dying from diseases that Europeans had transferred over to them, uh, and then speaking about the chattel slavery that took place here, and then speaking about the struggle to get out of slavery, speaking about the uh, misconceptions people have about what that struggle of, uh, of abolishing slavery was like speaking about reconstruction which I think is a time period uh, that doesn't get spoken on enough and that we uh, aren't informed on enough love bro love bro I'm gonna holler at you back I'm gonna be here but for sure I'm gonna be here bro uh, and so uh, going back and uh, him speaking on reconstruction I thought was very important uh, and I think that we just I want to find more books and more pieces of literature that speak about reconstruction and, and read and talk about that. It's a very important period. Uh, and so, and then he goes through the uh, Reaganomics and, and he gets us, you know, up to the end of the 20th century. And in the end of the 20th century, you see uh, uh, these murders taking place, uh, of hate crime murders taking place on this white supremacist level. And uh, as you see these hate crimes taking place on this white supremacist level, uh, uh, speaking of specifically James Byrd Jr. being killed, it made me harken back to where we are at right now, where in Georgia, Ahmaud Arbery, the murder of Ahmaud Arbery uh, is, uh, is still in trial today. Today is November, uh, what is it? Today is November 9th, still on trial November 9th. And uh, I think about all the different lynchings that have taken place here, the Emmett Tills, the Jordan Davis, who was uh, shot and murdered in Florida, whom Ami Abu-Jamal speaks on. And... It just makes me think about how far too often the way uh, black life is measured or black, pro excuse me, the way black progress in this country is measured is not by what the collective experience for black people is or not by even the unique experiences uh, and how those have altered for what black people go through. Uh, instead, it's sort of measured by the experience of the black people who have been accepted into the mainstream of society and what they go through. And so since it's easier now for a black person who's been accepted into mainstream society to exist, uh, because black baseball players and black basketball players aren't having bananas thrown at them on the court or uh, because uh, if you have enough money, you can and you have you could pay to send your kids to private school. You black, you could pay and send your kid to get, pay for your kid to get a better education. Uh, these are all things that are like, uh, or you can live in a, a neighborhood, a nicer neighborhood. These are all things that are for people who have been accepted into mainstream society, people who have enough money to uh, uh, exist within mainstream society to uh, to uh, go through. These are the things they go through. However, what poor black people experience in American society is the same in 2021 as it was in 2010, as it was in 2000, as it was in 1990, 1950, 1920, as you go back. Uh, the, the risk of being lynched 
just being killed just because you're black. Uh, and again, the people in, in, inducted closer into mainstream society of America can still experience these things. And as the Mamiya Abu Jamal went forward in the reading of Have Black Lives Ever Mattered, uh, that's one of the things that he touched on as Obama comes into office is that even though Barack Obama was a black man and he was the president and he was used to uh, masquerade as if the issues uh, uh, of the color line have been resolved and we lived in this colorblind society, uh, what was going on? beneath the surface was that uh, the existence for black poor people was continuing to be the same. The police state that exists in black neighborhoods was continuing to be the same. Uh, if, if not uh, a, a heavy uh, a spike or some type of a surge was coming from it because of uh, what is sometimes deemed as white backlash uh, from a black man being in the head of office. Uh, and also he said at the same time as Barack Obama was in the head of office, he still continued doing missile strikes. Uh, he he still continued uh, to uh, uh, have a lack. Uh, he, he did not go out of his way to uh, speak about these issues in the type of a manner uh, that would force white society as a whole to confront the issues of police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice. Uh, he, he went about it in a, a very liberal manner, a very liberal fashion, a very beat around the bush manner, beat around the bush fashion. Uh, one of the things that is uh, notorious is how he told protesters in Ferguson uh, to go home. Uh, and that's one of the things that Mamiya Abu-Jamal uh, brings up and speaks about. Uh, I think another one of the things that that's uh, stands out to me about this is imagining the perspective of me Abu Jamal must have on all of these the way that uh, history has unfolded for black people in America as he's been in prison for the last uh, since 1981 for the last 40 years this man has been in prison and so to see some of these things unfold for his community uh, I, I wonder what that must be like uh, and, and and to think about how he has found a way to contribute uh, to to black people as a whole, how this man who has been in prison in Philadelphia since 19 in Pennsylvania since 1981 uh, or since 1982, excuse me, uh, how in 2021 he is adding to the struggle against police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice in Rockford, Illinois, and in Winnebago County. And it's just a reminder that uh, every we, we never know uh, the things that we do and the actions that we take, the way that they will reverberate uh, through, uh, through history, the way that they will reverberate through the universe. And I think that that is why it's important for us to struggle in the manner that we have and to, con and to continue and to be steadfast in the manner that we have. Because I believe the same way that we're drawing strength from Ami Abu Jamal here in Rockford, that uh, somewhere in uh, South Africa or in uh, 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 Palestine or in uh, Florida in 10 years or in five years or in f five months, it'll be somebody uh, drawing that same type of strength from us, that same type of inspiration and motivation from us. And I think uh, that that's a symbiotic relationship uh, that continues the struggle, that keeps the struggle going on. And so... Also, one of the things that he spoke, that Mami Abu Jamal brought up that uh, I'm not very informed about. This is my, some of my first time reading about it, but was uh, Christopher Dorner and the experiences that Christopher Dorner, a black police officer, had while he was on the force. Uh, this was in Los Angeles, I believe. Uh, and Christopher Dorner, you know, and I'd heard the story of Christopher Dorner before, uh, but I, this is the first I'd, I'd really read anything about it and, and, and seen anything about it and uh, had anything sort of comprehensive about it. I'm not, you know, and it wasn't, this was not, again, all the passages in here, are, are everything within the book is very short passages. Uh, it reads like a, very much like a diary. I don't know if I, like, yeah, it's sort of like a, a, a diary of a, a, a a freedom fighter, a diary of a freedom fighter, as he's telling, talking about the people who have, whose lives have been snatched uh, due to the struggle that he's waging or the struggle that he's in. And so Christopher Dorner, uh, February 18, 2013, uh, it made me recall, you know, Christopher Dorner did not kill himself, but the actions that he took led to his, uh, his death. And they were actions that inevitably would lead to his death. He was, uh, you know, killing police officers and targeting law enforcement officials and their uh, uh, their loved ones. 
Uh, and again, I when the way that Mamie Abu Jamal speaks about Christopher Dorner is he brings up the fact that Christopher Dorner, what what did Christopher Dorner? experience what type of institutionalization what type of indoctrination did christopher dorner uh deal with while inside the law la los angeles police department while inside this this law enforcement agency that would uh lead for him to uh react in this type of way that would lead for him to go on this type of a killing spree to have this type of a manic break or this type of a neurological break uh to do these things and then he also pointed out how uh christopher dorner had been trained by the police to, to say he he uh these police officers had trained this man who obviously was uh not uh, mentally fit for this uh the uh this position and for this type of uh uh, tactical training to be bestowed upon him and they trained him and then they sent him out into the uh excuse me to the community and they speak about christopher dorner having uh interactions with other police officers where a police officer uh used a racial slur and christopher dorner uh felt as if it wasn't uh, a proper response by the powers that be to this racial slur being used and one of the things that i would almost guarantee you is that it's no way that it is a black police officers who are not <laughs> experiencing racism as black police officers. Uh, law enforcement is no the law enforcement by far, and it don't matter unless. And again, maybe if you go into a city where the you can it's a disproportion, a humongous disproportionate amount of people of color on the law enforcement and uh, in, in the law specific in one specific law enforcement department, but. You can guarantee that law enforcement as a whole is one of the most racist jobs you can have, the most prejudice, pre prejudices, biased jobs you can have. And if you are black and rising through the ranks of any of these police departments, you have just accepted dealing with racism. The same way if you a woman rising through the ranks of these things, you just accepted dealing with uh, misogyny. And uh, and so. That is, and that's one of the reasons as well why we can't simply just point to this idea of going to work for the police department as a way to solve the po the issues of the police department or becoming a police officer as a way to uh, absolve the institutions of, of policing. Because uh, it's clear that there is trauma that is experienced just by the indoctrination of becoming a police officer. So we don't need to uh, uh, put more people through that type of uh, traumatic uh, experience uh, with the understanding that Individuals do not manipulate systems. Systems manipulate individuals. Uh, and until we get to a place collectively that we stop uh, viewing so many things through the lenses, lenses and perspectives of individual individualism, we won't ever be able to properly struggle against these systems because systems uh, feed off of people viewing things from an individualistic aspect. Uh, and, and collectively, when we start uh, viewing things from a collective aspect, that's when we start viewing things from a position in which systems are vulnerable. Systems are vulnerable to uh, collective action, but they're not vulnerable to individual ideology. And so Christopher Dorner went to the police department with individual uh, individualistic ideology and the systematic uh, and systemic racism and exploitation and trauma that exists within uh, the Rafa Police Department, excuse me, within the Los Angeles Police Department, uh, destroyed him. And Mami Abu-Jamal asked the question, again, what is going on in that police department for that to happen? Uh, another one of the things that I thought was very important is Mami Abu-Jamal uh, repeatedly calls re, uh, harkens to Angela Davis, excuse me, her, Angela Davis, harkens to Michelle Alexander in the book, The New Jim Crow, as he is going through these passages of Have Black Lives Ever Mattered. And uh, I believe The New Jim Crow to be one of the most important pieces of literature that I have read in my entire life. And it also uh, is one of the 
one of, if not the most important piece of literature that I have read, I have read concerning the struggle against police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice. And uh, I think that one of the things that has been a commonality is reading through these different books and pieces of literature and seeing somebody hearken to the new Jim Crow and hearken to Michelle Alexander. I've listened to Michelle Alexander speeches and listen to Michelle Alexander interviews. And I just think that uh, Michelle Alexander is uh, uh a well of knowledge, a well of wisdom, a well of information and experience that can never be drawn on too many times. I've read the new Jim Crow twice uh, in pieces twice. I read it through completely one time and then I've, I've read it in pieces uh, other times. Uh, but each time I read it, I take something new from it. I under I understand something from a different perspective. And so uh, I, I would want to encourage people to go and read the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. Uh, I'm going through the book The Central Park Five The Central Park Five was something that Mami Abu-Jamal And I, th I believe that uh, The proper proper Name For the young men For the men The men, my elders You know, Now at this point uh, Is the Vindicated Five I believe is what they go by Excuse me Go by or the exonerated five, maybe. Or the exonerated five. But he, when me, Abu Jamal brings up, man, my fault. I'm going to move this cord. Uh, man, I know that's probably some bad mic feedback. Okay, when me, Abu Jamal uh, speaks about the case and the implications that this case had, uh, these young men who got, went to prison and were wrongfully convicted and how the policing, the institution of policing and the police department manipulated the innocence and naivete of these young men, these young men of color and these young boys of color and imprisoned them. And uh, it, I don't know how many people have seen the movie or the, excuse me, the, the series. It was a, a short series, a mini series. When they see us on Netflix, uh, by I think it was executive produced by Ava DuVernay. It's an amazing, amazing, amazing. Excuse me. Oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. Amazing series. Uh, it's very uh, emotional. It's very difficult to watch at times, uh, but it's very informative. It it it, it does the job of making you. Uh, of opening up your empathy and opening up your understanding. I think that when done properly, uh, that's something that a special, uh, a special dynamic that that films have, a special dynamic that uh, TV shows, TV series have uh, that's maybe separate from documentaries where I think a lot of times I think documentaries can open up your understanding and, you know, can also open up your empathy. But for me, a lot, it, it opens up your understanding of something uh, as in uh, films and TV shows can sort of open up your empathy to someone and to something. And I think that that's what happens in the When They See Us doc, uh, TV series. So I recommend people watch that. Uh, but uh, again, he does a good job of uh, speaking in this book of the dangers that children of color deal with uh, from police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice, which makes me think of uh, little Mike Sago Jr., who was murdered here in Winnebago County by off duty Winnebago County Sheriff Deputy, a young black boy. Makes me think of Logan Bell, an 18 year old uh, young black man who was murdered and shot here 16 times, murdered by the Rockford Police Department. It uh, makes me think of uh, Tamir Rice, uh, who was killed in Ohio. Uh, makes me think of Trayvon Martin. It makes me think of Emmett Till. It makes me think of uh, I can't uh, Makia Bryant. I believe that is her name. She was just uh, murdered uh, directly after the acquittal of George of not George Zimmer. Directly after the guilty verdict was, came in against Derek Chauvin, who had murdered uh, George Floyd. Uh, I think that's what that brings me to. One of my next thoughts that I had is uh, it made me I, I read through this and I wondered where does uh, Mami Abu-Jamal sit uh, right now in 2021 seeing the things that have ravaged the black community when it comes to uh, the murder of George Floyd, the shooting of Jacob Blake, the murder of Breonna Taylor, the lack of justice for any of those things, the continuing average of 900 plus annually of people who have been murdered by uh, police officers uh, 
what does he think about the where the movement stands at right now? I, I also know that uh, Mamiya was dealing with having COVID last year and was hoping to try to get released last year, and that wasn't something that was able to be done. I wonder what he thinks about uh, what what t- what things he's experienced while being inside a prison with dealing with COVID nineteen. What type of light can he shed on the what what that inmate experiences has been like? Uh, the inhumaneness of it. Uh, I'm sure the. Uh, when I was in jail, you know, there's only for a small amount of time, so I'm not comparing anything to like someone like Mamiya who's in, uh, in, in in prison and has been there for decades. Excuse me, almost a half a century. Excuse me, almost a half of a century. Uh, but it was tw- 22 hours in, two hours out. So you got to be out the cell for two hours because of COVID, and then you had to be in the cell for 22 hours, and uh, it was, and it was horrible. Yeah, it was horrible. And so I wonder what some of his thoughts are on how things have unfolded in 2020 and 2021. Uh, I also think about uh, the try the uh, there's two trials that are still taking place, which have direct reflections and connections to the Black liberation struggle. It is the trial that's taking place uh, for Cal Rittenhouse uh, in Wisconsin, uh, and then it is the trial that's taking place. Uh, of the murder of Ahmaud Arbery in Georgia. And it is going to be interesting to see what happens with these cases. I wonder what Mamiya's perspective will be on these cases. Uh, I wonder what, what, what type of reaction this country will have to what, whatever the verdicts are in these cases. I think that, I think that too often people forget about these issues and forget about this, uh, this oppression and exploitation and, and, and murder that goes on until, uh, Excuse me. Until it is a, a national story or until it is some type of national outcry. So uh, I also wonder, you know, will this national, will whatever national reaction comes from this, will it pull up some story of police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice that is on the margins and, and elevate it and give it another platform? I think that's one of the things that uh, I take away from this book as being important to do as well is that a lot of these stories – uh, of police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice, macroaggressions manifesting and costing people their lives, people's lives being snatched from them. Uh, a lot of them were pulled from the margins by the murders of Trayvon Martin, by the murders of, by the murder of uh, Michael Brown. And uh, we watched that as when after George Floyd was murdered, he pulled from the margins the stories of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery. Uh, and it's possible that even the story of Jacob Blake would have been more marginalized had it not been for the hypersensitivity to uh, the police terrorism that was taking place on black people uh, in America when he was shot directly after what took place with George Floyd. Uh and so those are some of my those are just some of my some of my thoughts. I mean, I probably I could go on on and on about some of my thoughts about have Black Lives Ever Matter by Mamiya Abu Jamal. But we want to keep these podcasts with with below thirty minutes, and we got it at thirty seven minutes now, so it's already long, and I'm already running late putting it out. Uh, but after this episode, the next episode will be us reading Race Matters by Cornell West. Those episodes are already pre-recorded. Where I'm about halfway through the book right now in real time. And so those episodes will be ready for you with no delay. I want to thank all the people that have been constantly listening to this. I want to thank all the people who are catching up listening to it. I want to ask you to please share this on whatever platform you're listening to it on. I want to ask you to listen to this with a friend. Uh, talk about these things that you listen, that you, as you listen to them. Pause them and talk about them. Pause them and reflect. Uh, We put these out every day to present everybody the opportunity every day to begin on their struggle to end police terrorism, mass incarceration or racial injustice or to take another step further into their uh, struggle to end police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice. Information is key. We outside.